have been really, really good too. Okay, and again, these have come out of direct feeds, have been one of the traders on these. They've been very Can useful. You tell us the other day? Yeah. That same yep. Yeah. yep. So they, they tend to come out of Newcastle or Brisbane, so you've got to just look at where that freight is, and, and these things tend to be reasonably tight. These do, these do go in a silo. Okay, they are pelletised, they will flow, they can be added to your dairy feed as a, you know, there's nothing to say we can't feed 12 kilos in the dairy except time, but it could be 4 kilos of this and 7 kilos or 8 kilos or something else. Okay, so there's different ways to bring feed to cows. All right. They quoted them at 440 a tonne on New York. Landed. Landed. Back here. Landed on that farm. Like yeah. There. Yep. Yep. And again, it can be a real good option compared to hay. We've actually had so one. What about them against TDG pellets? Different food. Different. Different feed altogether. Yeah. Can you combine it? Oh, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But you still need your long fibre, but the two can work really together. So these are really, what these are, they're a very highly digestible fibre source. Okay, because when, when you look at the feed test here, you say, well, how can a. How can a 67% NDF feed, which is a really high NDF, be 11 megajoules of energy, all right? It comes because the NDF is highly digestible. It's highly digestible fibre. There's only what we call 3% lignin in there. So lignin is, is the woody fraction of, of, of plants that nothing can digest except, I think, for termites. Okay, and they use, they use a special acid to do it. So you can still have a high NDF feed with a low lignin fraction, and that fibre is highly digestible, which is great because it actually helps with butter fat, okay, because you're digesting fibre, and the product of fibre digestion tends to be acetate or butyrate, all right? They tend to be the fatty acid precursors for butter, butter fat production. So this can be a really, really handy feed. And again... How much you feed a day of that? Depends what else you're feeding, Ron. But you could feed two to five kilos in that range, very, very comfortably in that range for, for jerseys. Yeah, yeah. No, no real limits. It's not going to hurt anything. It's just a matter of what you're pushing out and what else you're moving in there to balance things up. All right. But these, these, those two feeds in particular have given us a lot of flexibility to manage high hay costs in particular. Not so much to manage concentrate costs, but to manage high hay costs, which has been a lot of people's key exposure. The other thing is that you can pour, you know, if you're looking to supplement cattle that aren't milking, you know, two or three kilos of palm kernel can make a big difference to, to growing heifers that have still got some pick. All right, a couple of kilos of these can make a big difference to, 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 um, to dry cows, all right, if they don't have a lot of other feed, you know. So, you know, we can go back and we, can, we, we won't do all the maintenance calculations and those things at the moment. I'm just saying that these are very, very good options for your non-milking stock as well. Okay, other than hay that can be quite convenient and minimal waste. All right? And they just sit in that, in that space as part of the, the matrix of what we can use. But well, it's just, just around four, give or take 40, depending on where you are and your freight subsidy game. For Newcastle, 440 at our place. Yeah, yep. so you're looking at 25, probably 15 to 25 to get stuff up from Newcastle, isn't it, I think, in ton, a tonne. So, yeah, and, that, and they'll keep coming in. All right, I've spoken to the importers and palm kernel will keep coming in at this stage. All right. Okay, so the forage situation, and um, we've touched again on this already. Um, the cereal hay and silage situation is, 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 the hay situation is all right at the moment. We're seeing stuff, depending on how far south you go, leave farm from anywhere from 200 to 400 bucks a tonne. It tends to be the closer to point you get, the more you will pay, all right? If you really want to buy expensive feed, just shop around Cowra and Forbes, all right? There seems to be, pardon? <laughs> <laughs> or Scott's, I'm not going to talk about your stuff yet, Scott. <laughs> all right, um, but the closer to home, the more you tend to pay. And again, it's looking at what that interaction is between the price X farm and your freight subsidy. And the less feed that you're buying, okay, the more freight subsidy that you can potentially tap into. Well, if we talk about $40,000, it means you could buy 400 tonne of feed with 100 bucks a tonne off on freight subsidy. Right, so you, you know, the smaller farms won't be buying that amount of feed. Okay, and if it's smaller, smaller freight amounts, it's actually quite a lot. So it's a very, very generous and useful subsidy you know, when it's applied appropriately. Um, Cereal silages, I, I, I hate buying silages, okay, generally. Sorry, Scott. Um, 
because you know we need to be calculating our costs of feed on a dry matter landed basis. And I'll just walk through a quick exercise on that shortly. Canola silage and hay. Been a fair bit of canola hay out there. The silage tends to be absorbed locally. I wouldn't ship it up here in a pink fit for a number of reasons. I hate shipping water that far. Okay, but yeah, I'm, I'm just I just get a bit scared of the canola. Um, I've seen it used really well. I've seen some outstanding canola hay made. All right, but I've also seen some problems with it too. And unless you can mix feed, a TMR it, I'd be pretty reluctant to use a lot of canola hay. Okay, and I'll talk you, you through. Use the percentage of the diet you would go with canola? Depends on how much nitrate's in it, Josh. <laughs> okay. So we do have to be really careful managing nitrate risk with it. And it depends how bad it is. Okay, so look, we could, we could have up to 50 to 60% of the, of the forage component of the diet coming from canola hay. And we've certainly done that. And the good stuff is really, really, really good. You know, it can be high teens protein, 11 plus ME, you know. But you see this huge spectrum in drop off in quality, you know, as soon as that NDF fraction creeps up, because its NDF is poorly digestible. What about tainting? A little bit of taint. So again, we don't like to go generally above 50% of, the, of any ration as a brassica portion. Okay, it's the same for grazed brassicas as well. I haven't heard much report on taint on canola silages or haze. I'm sure it would, could potentially be an issue. You know, it's not like though when the cows go on a heap of turnips twice a day, you know, and you can't, yeah, that can be nasty. Um, but huge variation in quality. We'll look at some feed tests in a minute and this nitrate risk is real. Legume haze have been out there. Um, probably more a fan of buying vetch and carting it a long way rather than buying lucin. Okay? And again, big differences in feed tests. We've tended to see the vetch haze out of Northern Vic, Southern New South Wales, Eastern South Australia come in at reasonably good value for the feed quality. Some of it's actually quite amazing feed quality. Tends to be better value than lucin hay. All right? And the great thing is the horse guys haven't woken up to that yet. All right? So we Big fan of good vetch hay, if you can get it. Don't and one problem with vetch hay, it's not grown up here. Absolutely, Max. <laughs> yeah. You can grow vetch, but you can't, you can't make hay. You can't make hay at the time when it comes through. No, look, it's a cracking hay. I've got another report. No worries, Max. Thanks for coming. That's all right. Take care, mate. So the legume hay is really, they're there. There's been a little bit of clover, but you're not going to see much really this year, I don't think. So really, it's vetch or lucin. And I think if you're looking, then then than vetch. The interesting thing, you know, we've probably seen, given the cost, if, if you've been on the buying space for the high quality cereal haze, which have, some of them have been absolutely outstanding, we've probably been able to do cheaper rations with very good cereal haze, a protein source and grain, okay, for, for lower costs than when we've been based on, on things like vetch. But if you can access it, it can be really, really good. Summer forages, okay, and again, We'll talk a little bit about that later, all right? Um, focus on water use efficiency, really, really important here. And again, I think, you know, Scott's certainly seen a big change in, in his enterprise by being more focused on summer forages and what that's done probably with some of those increases in forage harvest have been profound. It gives you choices with your other forages as well, okay? But also keeping a good focus on quality because it's quite easy to grow a lot of jungle, okay? you've got to have a pretty strong set of parameters that you're going to work in with respect to harvest heights and the like if you want to get milk out of that too. That's the stuff you sell. That's the stuff you sell. <laughs> straws and stubbles, look, I, I don't use these much, okay, but we have at times used straws when we've needed to, okay, and again, the straws become really, really useful when hay is extremely expensive and we can access some of these other byproducts. Okay, because we can set those rations up with maybe two or three kilos of straw in a TMR type situation to give us the effective long chew. And then we can have the chemical fibre coming in with the other non-hay fibre sources such as the palm or the, um, or the um, soy pellets. Yeah, um, almond hulls are another one in that space. So look, what are we seeing? There's a fair bit of hay around now. Okay, I, I don't anticipate there being a lot of hay for a long time. All right, so if you know you need hay and you know you're going to need more, I'd be trying to manage that as soon as you can, okay? And I think that's really important advice to take, to take you know, across to other people that you're talking to because I think that price will only go north, particularly for quality, 
And again, while we're still seeing haze come off in the far south, a lot of the hay making has actually been done already. And, and we are seeing whole farms of hay being bought up by people that don't intend to use it themselves. All right? And it's, there's big dollars floating around. This is the big speculator market that we're seeing. We've had that softening of that production from South Australia. Yep. It is going to tighten. It is going to tighten. So calculate your normal minimum and work forward from there based on what you can grow and, and, or, or have grown yourself and what you can afford. And again, there is issues of affording hay, okay, and, and, and not everyone's going to have the cash to go out and buy 100 or 200 tonne of hay, okay, that's, that's absolutely given. But if you have trusted suppliers, you know, you, and again, we've had a lot of issues, I guess, with people thinking they had hay secured, they've gone to pick it up and it's disappeared. All right, but again, it's about building those long-term networks with people in the good times that hopefully, hopefully, they look after you a bit when things are tighter. Okay, purchase feeds. Are you getting what you paid for or paying for what you are getting? Okay, and I guess there's a lot of this happens. You know, people pay pretty badly when they haven't really worked out what they're actually getting. Purchase forage is still available. New season cereal hays and straws. New season legume hay is reducing, but they're going to get expensive canola hay and silage. Prices are all very high, okay, and there are lots of traps. Quality varies greatly on feeds, all right? Energy, protein, NDF, ADF. Purchase of wet feeds is a really, really risky space, okay? Yeah, with that in mind, what would you, like, what would you say about the loose grain? I think brewer's grain's an outstanding feed, and again, we price it based on a, a, um, a dollar per tonne dry matter compared to alternatives. So, you know, I think for people that can utilise it without wastage, it's a really, really good option. It sits in that space of a hay replacer or a pasture replacer rather than a grain replacer, but it's got a good protein value too. So brewers, you know, if we can get it, I know you guys have got some access, you know, through your network. Um, at the moment, anyway. Exactly. <laughs> That's what happens going forward. I hope that was part of your contract. Um, I don't think we control enough of it, too. So I think the I, I think the aim of the project was to give back to those that we had. Yeah. So we didn't really advertise it to new ones. We probably put expressions of interest out to existing base. And then it was all there, were, there were a couple of farms, first on the South Coast, that changed to line to get... Yeah, I know exactly what get, yeah. Yeah. Can I get you to grab a glass of water? Yes. yes. Um, but because of the season it's been, it's all fully utilised and existing. So. Yeah. Stunning. Great food. And, and again, you know, as long as you're turning it over in seven to ten days and, and doing all this stuff to look over, because it heats over summer in particular, but you know, if it's been sitting at 80 bucks, landed on farm in that sort of spot, price, that's a, that's a good price. It's a sustainable price for, for people to farm off. You know, it gets it back at that 320 a tonne dry matter. You know, we can we can work with that, and, and your farmers can make a margin. If it gets north of 100, it becomes really marginal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm not saying it is. Yeah. 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 And we've seen it south of 80, depending on how close to Sydney you are too. Yeah, yeah. Really simple calculation that you guys can do is just to work out what your feeds that you're buying are costing on a dry matter basis. And this is really important when you start buying silages in particular, but also when you're comparing haze, okay? Because your 400 buck a tonne oat haze is 470 bucks a tonne dry matter when you, when you run up your 85% over it. Okay, similarly though, your loosened silage is 350 bucks a tonne, which sounds really good if you don't know what you're doing. If that's at 45% dry matter, all right. It's actually worth about $778 a tonne dry matter. And there's no doubt we've seen particularly silages. Okay, and here's, here's an example at 80. Have I got that wrong? That's, that should be 320. Sorry, Catherine, there's, a, there's an error on this one. Oh. Yep, that's, that should be 320 on that cell there. Yep. All right. But basically the equation's pretty simple. You look at the dollar price, and if it's 90% dry matter, you divide by 0.9. Okay. So if it's barley hay at 86, you divide 250 by 0.86, and that'll give you your price per tonne of dry matter. Similarly, if it's loose and hay at 550 a tonne, you divide it by, if it's 85% dry matter, you divide by 0.85, and it comes back at 647, right? 
But there's a huge range in what we see in dry matter percentages and energy and protein. All right? So this, is, this stuff becomes really important when, once you work out what you're buying the feed for. Okay? If the purpose is just to buy for fibre for a little bit of ration support, you know, we can probably take a, a higher NDF, a higher fibre version of a feed. Because if all we're chasing is a couple of kilos to mix of other bits and pieces that are low NDF or highly volatile, that can actually be ideal. The flip side is that if I need eight or 10 kilos of it to actually get milk of, out of, you know, the more of a feed you need, the higher its quality should be, okay? Because every mouthful that you eat, all right, you wanna make sure the most out of that mouthful is actually convertible back to milk, right? But they're just a, a set of ranges that we typically see. So when someone says, I've got some good grass pasture silage, it can be anywhere from 12 to 27% protein, depending on whether it's you know, some, some Rhodes grass or Kaikuyu that, that wasn't well fertilised compared to, to rye grass, okay, that has been well fertilised. It's a huge range that we see. Um, and that ME, I haven't, sorry, I was correcting a lot of these last night, that, that range in pasture silage will go from probably 6 to 10.5 ME, you know, huge ranges. And similarly, we see the same range across the loosened silage. Loosened silage is particularly bad <coughs> and loosened hay as the NDF, when it blows out, it gets really, really ropey and indigestible. So feed dis feed, feeding going wrong, you know, sorry about the, the bales again, guys. Okay, but purchasing feed, feed first dry matter. So, so buying by the bale is fraught with danger, all right? If you buy your feed by the bale, and it's amazing how many <coughs> smart people, or otherwise smart people I've seen caught in a panic situation that start buying feed by the bale. How many advertisements do you see by the bale? Absolutely all of them, you know. Oh, no. Not all. So you go onto that Facebook hay and grey trading site in New South Wales, good site, okay, worth having a look at to give you an indication of what's out there, but you see all the stuff up there by, by the bale. Well, what's a, up, they have no weight on it. What's a bloody bale weigh? Yeah, no, okay, and what's the dry matter percentage? So bales can weigh anything from 200 to 800 kilos, okay? But people still buy by the bale and sell by the bale. Yeah, so you've got to buy by the ton. You need to know the dry matter percent as well. Okay? Senior, we brought some once and the guy showed us these. They'd done all these core samples. Yes. But it was like four lots of silage before and I just kind of got a bit of a glimpse and I thought, shit, that date's pretty old. Yeah, 1922. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, it, and Kerry had it tested for us because we, before he brought it on the farm. Yep. And it was like just feeding them bloody sawdust. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You've got to be and super said, careful, Rob. This is what it tested. Yep. I said, yeah, but it wasn't that, was it? No. And look, there's a problem. You know, feed testing, brilliant, advocate, do it. But at the end of the day, they only test the sample that's been submitted to the lab. Yeah. All right? Yeah. And, and that might be broadly representative, but it may not be. And, you know, you've got a thousand bales in the stack, even if you're doing a random core sampling on it, you're still only going to get five or six of them to go in there. So it's, it's a difficult game, but some data is generally better than none, okay? And I think it's, it's important if you can get it. So looking at your cost per tonne of dry matter is really, really important. Wet, the, the wet matter is the same as the ad fed. Now, if we look, for example, at buying wheat silage at $150 a bale, which sort of sounds really cheap in the middle of a drought, Yep, okay. So 500 kilo bales of 50% dry matter, 300 bucks a tonne wet. That's the price of the wet food. And 50% dry matter, okay, it's basically $600 a tonne dry matter. All right. So getting caught on this sort of thing is something you really need to avoid. All right. The flip side, your wheat, hundred, your wheat hay, which you could be buying probably land for that price of freight, su freight subsidies at the moment at 85% dry matter, 400 bucks a tonne wet. It's $470 a tonne dry matter for good wheat hay landed. That's before we take freight subsidies into account. Okay, so just be really, really, really aware, particularly buying wet feed. It's a really important message again for... But if your hay's been down for 10 days to dry out, yep. isn't your silage better? Not necessarily. Yeah. Doesn't Not necessarily. Depends on how good the silage was when it was made. Yeah, that's right. If, if you so they're not always equivalent, you, Scott. So that's cut, exactly cut right. Same crop, oh. If you cut the same crop and put in the silage, say at sixty-five percent dry matter, which yep. Is about mine. Which would take you three days, probably. Yeah. Yep. Two to three days. Yep. Or you dry it out to hay, which would yep. take you a week. Yep. 
your size is probably going to be better. There's differences actually, yeah, yeah because because some of your fermentation burns a bit of energy. Yeah, right. Okay, yeah. but look, I mean, it depends on the quality of the fermentation, how quickly it's been able to drop the pH yeah. to preserve the sugars and yeah. the and the protein. Right, really well dried, quick hay. Like if I was at the end of the season and I had ryegrass. Yeah. All right, that I'd cut, you know, yeah. a little bit of seed on it. That hay, if it's dried and dried quickly at that time of year, yeah, it can be outstanding days, feed. Yeah. And it does, it locks in all those sugars as sugars rather than converting yeah. them to, yeah. to a lot of them to, the um, to, to volatile fatty acids. Yeah. yeah. But they're not always equivalent. But again, this is just probably the first step, Scott, yeah. when people are making decisions. Yeah. And I guess it's when people, people are getting caught here or, or you know, up closer to a thousand bucks a ton. Yeah, that's right. I mean, this is another one we saw last year. All right, this is this is a real advertisement on one of these websites. All right, for corn silage for sale out of the pit in Northern Vic. Three hundred and fifty-five bucks a ton. That was the price ex pit, not per ton dry matter. Okay, so you can multiply that by nearly three. Yes, People bought it. Okay, because people were desperate and they didn't do the basics. And so many people out there in the farming community don't actually understand dry matter as a starting point. I don't know who these guys are. I don't think they were involved in this. But this is an ind that's just an ad. This is the sort of ads you don't want to have. You don't want to be beside. <laughs> All right. But this, this is the, these are the inquiries from, you know, that's how you can get in contact and you can buy that cheap silage. All right, because everyone's thinking, well, hay's 500, silage, it's better than hay, 355 bucks a ton, but you know, yeah, that's nasty. Hay now, yep. And that's it's 14 percent protein. Yep. But when you look at it, it's got grain heads in it. Yep. It's a fail crop. Yep. But I said, if you want the MDA, you know, like MDF. The MDF. It. Yep. He said, oh, I've got no idea. Yep. We didn't but, buy it, mind you. Yep. Yeah, but he said, oh, it's 14 percent protein. I said, yeah, but it might be worth. That's right. But it still could be good. If it's got the grain head, the first thing you should do is rub the grain head in your hand. And if you've got big grains coming out of it, then, you, then you've got a, probably a, a failed crop that's been cut late. Yeah, this, yeah, and you can see it's been wet too because yeah. it's a bit black. But if you rub the heads and not much comes out of it, it's probably been salvaged early. Okay? And it it's, could well be okay. Yeah. So the head's not so bad. It's, it's whether it's set to grain. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, they, said, they said it often got this 40 percent protein. Yep. Test. Yep. But yeah, they couldn't tell you nothing else. No, no, no. And they'll, they'll have it, but they've probably just don't understand the test themselves. Yeah. So.